as we walk through the book of Ephesians, I am, uh, man, I love it. I love studying Ephesians. It is, uh, it's crazy with all that's in there. Um, and and as, we were, as we we're looking at this portion of Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 3, it's, it's a section of where Paul is like kind of, I don't know, setting the stage for the fact that he's going through something difficult. But even as he's going through something difficult, you see that his perspective as he walks through it is honestly, it's really challenging. And, and it, it got me thinking just like, what if Paul like knew the stuff that stressed me out? Like what would he think? And so I was like trying to come up with like stupid things that stress me out. I was having a little bit of a challenge. Then I asked my wife, and she had a huge list. Um, she just, oh, what about this? And, and you know, it's a huge list of stuff. I mean, I, like little stupid things, but man, I tell you what, they can, they can stress me out. Um, you know, like, like dumb things like, uh, I don't know, like the laundry just sitting in the dryer, you know? Like, because I know that if it doesn't get out immediately, it's just going to live there. It stresses me out. Like, I don't know. Some of you relate. Some of you are like, that doesn't stress me out. Yeah, that's why that stresses me out. Um, I don't know if you've ever had this moment happen to you. Um, but I am, I am hyper, I don't know what it is, but man, when, when we cannot find a remote control, threat level midnight in the Godin household, I'm just telling you, I, I have done this and I am proud of it. I have, I've been sitting out there in our, in our living room watching something by myself and I couldn't find the remote and so I wasn't able to watch it. I called everyone out of their rooms and we all worked together to find that thing and I am proud because that's what, sometimes you just got to do that. And I think the one for me though that is like, I don't know, that probably the, the, right now this season of my life, what stresses me out the most, and this is dumb, but if you get it, you get it, it's when uh, the coffee isn't ready for the next day. You know what I mean? Like, you gotta, I gotta make it, I get up very early, and so I need the coffee to be ready by the time that I walk out of my bedroom. And, and so if it is six o'clock at night and the coffee has not been ready for the next morning, my eye starts twitching, and it's like, I have to get, I have, I have been out, I've been out in public, and you can text my wife, I've done this before, it's like, it's past six, and I'm like, hey babe, before I get home, can you make the coffee for tomorrow morning? And it's like, it's like 5.30 in the evening, like, I don't know, I'm just like, and I'm gonna get home at six, but I'm like, I just need to know that it's done. And, and like, that's it, like, little stuff, and then I think about Paul, okay, and where Paul's writing this letter, like, Paul is in prison, he is chained to another person, and I'm stressed about coffee. Like, I'm just saying, like, it's, he'd be like, man, dude, really? Oh, yeah, you got to get your coffee. I get it. Like, no, he'd be like, what is wrong with you? And, and, and as we pick up the text this morning, you see Paul really lean into what he's, like, what he's experiencing. And what you see is that what he is experiencing, it doesn't phase him. That he stays on mission with what God's called him to do, even though he's experiencing a circumstance that I think all of us would say, yeah, I don't know that I want prison. And we'll see that here as we pick up here in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7. It says this. It says, of this gospel, I was made, I, Paul, was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given. That, that something that Paul is like leaning into, and he's really leaned into this in, throughout the book of Ephesians, is that, that part of the Christian is experience, part of walking with Jesus, is this understanding that God is the one that does the work. That God's the one who does the work, that God's the one who initiates the work, so much so that even as Paul talks about himself as a minister, notice it's, he's not a minister because of his accolades. He's not a minister because of what he's experienced. He's not like, I am a minister because of my understanding of Judaism. No, he's saying, I am a minister because God did it. That every part of his life, from his salvation to his calling, that it only happened because God worked first. And then you see Paul talk about his calling. And I've already made mention of the fact that he's in prison, but it's worth noting that as he looks at his calling— he doesn't call it a challenge. He calls it a grace. That he's like, I am in prison because of my calling, and my calling is a grace that God has given to me. Now, I don't know about you, <laughs> but if like doing something for Jesus resulted in me being in prison, I'd use, I could use a lot of words to describe it, but I don't think grace would be one of them. Yeah, it's a challenge. It 
something that God is using to help me grow, you know, or whatever. But Paul's like, no, it is a grace that God is allowing this to happen to me. And then as it goes forward, you think, man, Paul is like, he says this line at the end. And, and, and at first glance, knee-jerk reaction to that line, I think we'd be like, man, this kind of sounds like false humility. He says that I'm the least of all the saints. The least. That word in the, in the Greek, it's actually translated leastus, but no one wanted to put that there because then they would look stupid. But it's actually translated least. Like Paul is exaggerating even with the word that he's choosing. And he's saying, yeah, I'm the, I'm the leastus. <laughs> Of all, the, of all the saints. And when he says saints, okay, so he's not saying like apostles, so he's not saying like, hey, there's like a top 12 ranking, and I'm at the bottom of the 12, makes sense, I didn't really know Jesus. Like, but no, he's saying, of every Christian that is alive, I'm the least. And, and you think about that, and you think about Paul. I mean, like, leastest, Paul? Like, the guy who wrote a large portion of our New Testament is defining himself as the leastest, that Paul literally brought the gospel to Gentiles, which is everyone in this room. Like it's because of Paul's ministry that like it came, and you're the leastest. But even if you think of his ministry up to this point, like he has planted churches all over the known world, and yet he's like, yeah, I'm the leastest. Even if you think about the idea of this, okay, he's in prison for his faith, okay? And if you were to hear that someone was in prison because of their faith, you would think, man, they're legit. (laughs) And yet here Paul is saying, no, I'm the leastest. And the reason why he's able to say that is because he understands how it works. We don't. Paul realizes that if, it, if there was a ledger of our debts to God, that all, and, and you were to compare your good works and cancel off the debts, that he, he knows that if there was a true ledger and it really worked like that, that every good thing that he does would not cancel out anything that he's ever done wrong. That, that he knows that based on our, our works and the things that we've done, all that we have before God is debt. And so for Paul to be able to say, no, I'm the least, is he's, he's saying something that he's already said earlier, which is, it is only by grace that you're saved. That there's nothing that you can do to, to, to do anything about that debt. And so he's like, yeah, I'm the least. Is. And so he says this, and then as he says this, he, he talks about what he's been doing. And he's like, I'm a minister by this grace, and this is the grace that has been given to him that you see here in, in the second part of verse 8, where he says this, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is plain of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Now I get it. You look up there and it's like, man, if you underline everything, Ryan, what's the point of underlining anything? I get it. I get it. But there's just so much there. Okay. Um, First off, he mentions that this idea of unsearchable riches. He's like, I have this grace that's been given to me to preach, to preach to the Gentiles this thing that God gives them access to, which is the unsearchable riches that are available to them in Christ. And, And if you think about it, like, that's what we do with things that are good. We share them. But if you discover something to be that beautiful, like, do you sit on it? Or do you bring people around to it? I think about this, like, one of the things I love, I love, is when, you know, you have friends who are, like, new to the area, they move in, and they want to go play putt-putt golf in Springfield, and you take them to Fun Acre, and they're like, how is this place even real? It's 18 holes for $2.50. And then they see the batting cages, like, oh, that's it. I bet the batting cages are real. No, they're a quarter. They're a quarter each. 
that Fun Acre is the only place in the whole wide world that has never been touched by inflation. Well, that in the Sam's Cafe. It's like, I don't know, maybe, maybe that guy should run the country. I don't, he's figured something out, man. And it's like, you're, and it's, it's kind of fun. And then you hear that like, oh, I, I, we actually brought our friends back there. And you're like, oh, cool. Like I was part of that, right? Like you, you're able to see something really good that I knew that I showed you. Paul's like, in Christ, there's these unsearchable riches that I want nothing more than I want for people to experience them. The, the, the idea there, it's such, it's such an interesting word that the word unsearchable, Lynn Kohik in her commentary mentions that, the, that, that what we translate unsearchable, it's such a rare word that that's the only time that it's used in the New Testament. So it's, Paul is really leaning into the vastness of what he's talking about. And, and then John Stott, he, he's saying that the idea that that word is communicating is that, that in God, he, you will never reach the end of his goodness. That there is this sense that like you'll never be able to come to the end of what he gives you. So Paul's like, I want to preach that to the Gentiles. And then if you go a little bit further, though, it says to bring to light. Okay, which is a similar idea, but like a little bit different. So with the idea of preaching, it's the idea that, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give information to a group of people that I'm going to go to a place, I'm going to give the information. But then when it talks about, like, bringing to light, that there is this sense, again, that you see throughout Ephesians, that in order for you to hear the gospel, God has to help you. That he, that in order for you to really hear it, he has to work in a way that will help you to, to, to walk out of darkness into light, which just shows us something that I think that we all know if we just think about it, and it's that if you are saved, it's a miracle. Like, it's a miracle that God would save you. That, that there is a real enemy who wants nothing more than to keep us blinded by the darkness that is around us. In order for us to really hear what is preached to us, it requires God helping bring people into the light. And so what is, he, what is he preaching? What is the idea? And it's the plan, the plan of the mystery of God. And I love the way that Tim Keller kind of explains this. But what's happening here with this plan is that you see really like he mentions creation. And what Paul is saying is he's saying that, that God's plan is to bring everything back together. And if you think about creation, it was made perfectly. It was made in harmony. It was the way that the things were supposed to be. And then what happened? Then we got involved. And, and as soon as we get involved, what happens? Everything starts falling apart. I mean, when, can you say that like that's kind of life? It's just things, we live in a world where everything is falling apart. I mean, what is death? It's your body falling apart. But Thomas Boston, the great theologian, says that man is born to die. Which would be a horrible thing to say at a baby dedication, right? But he's like, that's it. I mean, you're, you're just slowly heading in this direction where ultimately it, you just, it keeps breaking down until the part where it's, there's nothing left to break and it's over. Think about war. What's war? Well, it's relationships between nations that have broken down to a point where they can't see eye to eye anymore, so they're going to add to the, the breaking down of that relationship. Even think about your life. The things in your life that, that you hate. Why do you hate those things in your life that you hate? Well, probably because at some level, something moved out of harmony, right? That what Paul is saying, you want to know the plan? It's to bring it all back together. That God's plan is that, that no longer would we live in a world where everything is breaking down, but that someday, man, we'll be part of a world where everything's coming back together. And we're able to, to see that. And so he says that, and then he's like, the way that this is communicated, he's like, so the plan is to bring everything back together. How is this being communicated? And it's through the, probably the most, I don't know, most unlikely of sources. And you see this in verse 10. He says, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now 
be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That he's saying that the way that we show people that everything is coming together where it's heading, it's through the church. And, and the reason why he's able to say that, because what's the message that he has been beating? Is that in the church, the Jews and the Gentiles are to be one. That they're to be united. And what that is communicating, a united church, what it communicates, is it communicates what God wants to do, which is bring everyone together, no matter how different they might seem on the surface. And if you were to really think about the church, isn't that really what the church is? I mean, even if you think about, like, our church. You've got people all over the map on all kinds of different things in this room. I have those people watching online. There's even more. There are different nationalities present, different races present. There are people here in this room who you're, the way you came to God could not be more different than those around you. I bet there are people here, and your testimony is literally this. I have followed God, and it was good, right? Praise God for that. And then there are people in this room that are like, man, if you said my testimony from the stage, you would blood. Like, that's where you're at, right? But yet we're all here. We're all united, all with the same purpose. There are probably people in this room who've come back to Christ more times than you would like to admit, right? But yet we're all united, going in the same direction, coming together, worshiping Jesus. Even you think about, like, in terms of like, I don't know, social, social classes. There's rich, poor, middle class. So we're all here, we're all united. We're everywhere else in the world, these groups would be at odds. But Paul's saying the church is where they all come together. And that when they all come together in the church, that what you see is you see what God wants to do with creation, which is bring it all back together. And as it's doing this, it's also like, it's, he's, he's preaching. And I think it's really interesting because you see this like rulers and authorities. And so he's saying that not only are like people in our world watching the church, kind of taking their cues, but he's like, there's also like a spiritual world that is watching the church that we're preaching to. Where it says rulers and authorities, I mean, that, that's talking about angels and demons who are watching the church. And what the church is doing is it's communicating to the unseen realm the power of the gospel. I love the way that John Stott says it in his commentary. He says it this way. He says it is through the old creation, the universe, that God reveals his glory to humans. And it is through the new creation, the church, that God reveals his wisdom to angels. And before you're like, well, that's just, why? Like, that doesn't seem to make any sense. Like, why would he do that? Well, just think about your life. If I told you, hey, tomorrow, six billion people are going to watch you live, you'd be like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maybe do some things a little different. And what Paul is saying is saying, yeah, the unseen realm is watching your life. You are communicating to them the power of the gospel. You should be mindful of how you're living before them. And so he's like, that's what's happening right now. And then he looks ahead again and kind of talks about, okay, this is what's going on now, and this is where it's heading, and you, you see this here in verse, verse 11, where he says this, this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is for your glory. It's interesting, because what you have here is time in Ephesians. And it's interesting how Paul talks about time, and he points out something about God that I think that we, if you're here and you're like from church background or whatever, like it's not shocking to you. It's kind of what you think of when you think of God, and it's that word eternal. And, and without being redundant or silly, like eternal is a really long time. And I don't think that we always think about it like that because we're just like, oh yeah, he's eternal. That's how he works. But I, I was just thinking of like, I, I don't know, like a couple months ago, I had a conversation with a mentor of mine and I was just like, you know, 
we'd been, Joanne and I had been in the role that we'd been in for like seven years at the church, and so I was like, what are the next seven years going to be like? like? What is this? Like, who would have thought in seven years God was going to do all of this? Like, I, what are the next seven? And he did like any mentor did, which is crush you. And, and he was like, ah, I wouldn't think about seven. Uh, seven's way too long. He's like, really what you need to be thinking of is you need to be thinking in terms of three years. You can't plan for seven. And, and honestly, like, he's right. <laughs> you can't really plan for seven. Who would have thought, right? But God's plans are eternal. I can't plan for seven. But he can go eternity in one way with his plan. His, that's how big his plans are. But here's the crazy thing about Ephesians, is that you see that not only do his, his plans go eternally forward, but they also go eternally backwards. Look at, look at what he said in Ephesians chapter 1, just to kind of see the vastness of how God sees time. He says, even as he chose us before the foundation of the world. So God had a plan before there was even a world. We, can't, seven, we got to focus on three, and three is kind of long. Like, so, but, but he has eternally both ways he knows what he's doing. And so you go back to the idea of Paul being in prison. And that's because he sees him. He gets God. He's able to say what he says. Verse 13, where he says, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is for your glory. If this is who God is, then you don't have to lose heart. And so I want to give three reasons why that verse should give us confidence as we seek to know Jesus better. And the first one is this. One reason why that verse should give us a lot of confidence is that suffering can't ultimately hurt us in Christ. That if we are in Christ, suffering can't ultimately hurt us. One of the things that you you can't dispute if you look at this section going all the way back to verse 1. Paul's not worried about his suffering. He's actually not worried about it at all. But even if you go back to verse 1, he, well, how, does Paul, how does Paul talk about himself? He says, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, which is not technically true. Technically, he's a Roman prisoner. But what Paul's able to say is, like, no, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Though, though technically I'm a Roman prisoner, ultimately I'm a prisoner of Jesus. And what he's saying there with that is he's saying, yeah, the only reason why I'm experiencing this is because he allowed it. And if he's allowing it, then I can trust that he knows what he, I I know that he has something bigger in mind. And and, and as you look at the end of the passage, he knows that what God had in mind, it isn't that they would feel sorry for him. Which, Which shows us that like, that if if there's something more, and, and hear me, like, If there is nothing more than this life, then every discomfort should be devastating. That if there's nothing eternal waiting for you, then every discomfort, every suffering is something that is just in the way of what you want. But Paul's saying that's not how it works. That suffering can't ultimately harm me. And even you see this as Paul talks about his ministry where he calls it a grace. Why is he able to call his ministry a grace when it has brought so much suffering to him? It's because he knows that at some level, the sufferings that we endure, they help us know Jesus better. And if they help us know Jesus better, then we can be confident as we walk through circumstances that we would never sign up for ourselves we can know that he can use them for good. But it's worth saying, though, that that's true in Christ. That outside of Christ, man, suffering is different. You're kind of on your own. And not only that, but there is a suffering that that can really harm you outside of Christ. And Jesus talks about it in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 10. He says this, I think it gives us perspective with what Paul's walking through. Jesus speaking says, and do not fear those who, can, who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Why is Paul able to have such great perspective in his suffering? Because he knows they can't touch his soul. Everything they're doing, they're doing to his body, but they, they, they cannot even come near his soul because his soul belongs to Christ. 
And he says, rather fear him who can destroy both the soul and body in hell. That what, what we see here is that what Paul's saying, he's able to have this perspective with his sufferings because he knows that in Christ, your sufferings will expire. That there will come a moment where the sufferings are no more when you're in Christ. But when you're not in Christ, here's what you can know, is you can know that the good things in your life will expire. And so, so, so Christ is able to bring incredible perspective to our sufferings. And I think that we can be confident, even as we're walking through things that maybe we wouldn't want, that we can be confident in those things because what we know is we know that God has a plan. That his plan moves eternity, eternally in both ways. And if that is true, then when we are suffering, we can know that he can redeem it. So the first reason why we can be confident looking at the text is that, is that, that our sufferings can't hurt us ultimately in Christ. Second reason is this, is that we have access to infinite riches. That as we think about this text, one of the reasons why we can have confidence is that we have access to infinite riches. But if you look at verse 8, it says, This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. John Stott, he, he says that really that unsearchable is fine, but he's like, if he's like, if I were to if I were to define this word, I would define, I would probably say infinite. He's like, because the idea, what Paul's communicating there is, is one where he's like, you cannot reach the end of what God has for you. It's infinite. And, you know, if you think about, like, riches, especially our riches, um, you, can, you can absolutely reach the end of them. I remember, this is probably two and a half years ago, um, I remember I just made a large payment on our vacation that was coming up. And if you oversee the finances in your house, you've probably said something to this extent before, where you're like, hey, I just made this huge purchase. If we could, like, be really careful for the next month, then I think that we can catch up and get back on track. It's, it's like as soon as I said that, I backed into a car. And that was when I reached the end of my riches. And I mean, but it's like, it's like, yeah, you run out. Like you get to the end. Like there is an end. There is an end to what you have. And what Paul's saying is saying, yeah, not with Christ. And he's not talking about money, but he's talking about there is no sin that can keep you from him. That his grace that he can show you is so great that he can forgive what might be in your eyes even the most unforgivable sins. But you might be sitting here and you just, there, there's something in your past and there is a level of shame, there is a level of weight, there is a part of you that you just, you cannot shake that thing off of you. And you constantly are making yourself pay. Here's what, here's what Paul is saying. Is he's saying, Jesus Christ has enough grace to show you grace over that thing. So much so that when he, when he looks at you, he doesn't see it that his riches are unsearchable. Even, even beyond that, it works with how we pray. That, that, his rich, that, that when you come to him, there is, there is nothing inside of his will that he cannot do. That there's no thing that you could ask that is inside of his will where he's like, oh, sorry, I can't do that. So much so that when things don't go our way, it, it's not because he can't, it's because he has something else in mind. And even when I think about the idea of infinite, I think of space. And, and I, I think of like, man, if I wanted to go to space, I would need someone's help. <laughs> like, I can't just be like, hey, you know what, today I'm going to go to space. Um, you need someone beyond you to help you get there. And that's kind of how his riches work. That what God has for you in Christ is so great that the only way that you can really see it is if someone helps you. And that's what God does. He illuminates your heart so that you can better understand the gospel and so you can better understand really these, these, these riches that are available to you that are truly 
truly infinite. And then the last thing we see here in the text, and why, why we can be confident as we think about verse 13, is that we have a God who provides real access to him. That God provides real access to himself. And um, it got me thinking about this. this I think this happened in 2009, I think. Um, I, uh, I went to a conference, and uh, Tony Dungy spoke at the conference. If you don't know who Tony Dungy is, he was the coach of the Indianapolis Colts. He, he won a Super Bowl. He was one of the best coaches in the NFL. And so I went to this conference, and he spoke. And really what he was doing is I think he was probably selling his book. And, uh, but he went to speak, and, and there was this, this thing where it was like, hey, if you, if you buy his book, you can wait in line, and he'll sign it for you. And so I did. I was like, man, this is one of my sports here. This guy's a Christian. Like, sign it. And he, he really did. He signed it. Like, right there, that's Tony Dungy. See that? It'd be funny if I forged that. Um, <laughs> and I mean, I'm, I'm waiting in line, and it was, this was a long time ago, so it was somewhere between 30 minutes and four hours. I don't remember how long it was. And I remember waiting in line, because I'm like, I'm that guy. And I'm like, hey, I want to say something really funny to him so that he remembers me. And so I'm just sitting there, like, going through all this stuff, and I, get, I finally get up to Tony Dungeon, and I got less than a minute, because they're pushing people through. And I was like, hey, uh, I go way back with Peyton Manning. I lost his phone number. Can you give it to me? That was what I said. And he laughed and signed my book, and I went on my way. And um, I, remember, I remember going home, and I went home with, like, this, this book. And, and I was, or it was, I guess, I went back to the, not home, but I went back to my hotel. And I, was, I felt so cool. Because I'm like, man, I, I met... Like, I met one of my heroes. Like, I met this guy. I made him laugh, I think. And, and it was like, but, like, then you think about it, and I look back on it now, and I'm like, man, that was really not a big deal at all. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't have real access to Tony Dungy. That, like, even, even if you think about, like, book signings, right, they kind of make you look like a weird fanboy if you really think about them. I was super nervous. I had less than a minute really to talk. There was nothing about our communication that was really personal um, because I didn't didn't get that type of access to him. And what Paul wants us to see here in the text is that God, that he, he gives us access to himself. And it's the God who has boundless riches. Look at how it says we should talk to him and Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access and with confidence through our faith in him. But this is everything that my interaction with Tony Dungy was not. Paul's saying you, you can be bold with God. That you can ask for everything. That you can be frank and direct with him in a way that you can only be with those you're closest to. That God's saying you can come to him in a way that's, that's candid. You don't have to be buttoned up. That if I would have bore my soul to Tony Dungy in that one minute that I had, I would have walked away feeling lame and I probably would have got kicked out of the conference. And, and Paul's saying, yeah, God has more. And that's exactly how he wants you to talk to him. And I can't help but wonder, but maybe, maybe that's what some of you need to do. There's something about God to you where you're holding back. And he wants you to be candid. Maybe it's that you don't have a relationship with him and you know it. And what he wants you to do is he wants you to walk into that relationship. And that starts with you saying, I need you. Maybe there's a suffering that's going on in your life and you just don't understand why it's happening and you've never talked to him about it because you just think he knows. No, he's saying, talk to me about that. Maybe there's something in your life that you really want to see him do, but you just haven't been bold enough to ask him because you just feel like there's other things on his mind. What I'm saying is I'm saying that you have a level of access to him where inside of his will, there's nothing he can't do. And so maybe your response to this is to take that first step. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. And God, we're thankful for the type of access that you give us. We're thankful, God, that we can, that we can approach the one who Paul says, 
has boundless riches, and we can do it with confidence, with boldness, that you give us access, that we can be candid. And so I just, I pray for this room and those watching online. God, maybe there are people and there's something with you that they're holding back. And God, in this moment, in their heart, I pray they would give that thing to you. That you would help them to trust that you are everything that they need. And that God, that as they do, that we would all see that in Christ, our sufferings can't ultimately harm us. That we would really understand that you have boundless, infinite riches. And that God, that you give us real access to yourself. And so Jesus, we love you. And we thank you, God, for what is ours in you. And I just pray that we would walk into that. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Thank you so much for checking us out online today. We hope it was a blessing and an encouragement to your life. And if you would like to give today, there are two ways you can do so. You can text your amount to 84321, or you can go to giving.nlspringfield.com. Also, if you are new here, we have Party with the Pastors the first week of each month. We would love to see you there. We get to know you better, and you get to know us a little better, too. And also, we have services every Sunday at 8, 9, 30, and 11, and we'd love to see you in person. We will see you next week.